Praise the Lord, my brothers and sisters. This is Elder Joseph Stafford with the Man of From Heaven Ministries bringing to you again the Kingdom Principles. We started the series on the temple, the tabernacle, the sanctuary, so we can look at how that compares to what we are this day. There was no mistakes made in the Old Testament as to how things were put together. There was no mistakes made as how God brought things together and things he used as symbols. We're going to discuss that today and hopefully get a better view of where we really are in the presence of God. Let us pray. Father, we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We thank you for all the things you're doing for us, through us, and to us. I ask blessed upon all the hearers of this word that you bless them abundantly, cause them to see the things that you would have them to see, to be the people that you want them to be, and walk in the power which you ordain for us to have. We give you praise, honor, and glory, and never Yeshua, I pray. Amen. Amen. We uh, started our studies last week with uh, the part two version of the temple. We're on part three now. Um, Exodus 25, 1 through 14. I got through a portion of that. We got stuck on the Ark of the Covenant, but I want to go back on some things that were used to, um, that God asked for an offering for, to help build the sanctuary, to build the temple of the Lord. Um, he asked, I'm, I'm back into Exodus 25 again. First he says, Tell the children of Israel to take an offering for me from every man whose heart moves him to give willingly. You shall take my offering. Again, this is an amplified version, so it gives you a little more clarity in verses the thus these are those that comes to the King James. Nevertheless, it says, This is offering you are to receive from them gold, silver, and bronze. Blue purple and scarlet fabric, fine twisted linen, goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, porpoise skins, archaea wood, olive oil for lighting, balsam for the anointing oil, and for the fragrance incense, onyx stones and ascetic stones for the priest ephod, and for the breastplate. We're going to touch on that just a little bit today because um, there's some colors, things used that I want to touch on briefly. Um, let's talk about the breastplate starting off. The breastplate, or the priestly breastplate, in Hebrew mean is holson which was a sacred blessed breastplate worn by the high priest of the Israelites, according to Exodus. In the biblical account, the breastplate is sometimes termed the breastplate of judgment because of the Urim and the Thiurim, Thunum, excuse me, were placed in it. These stones were at times we used to determine God's will in a particular situation. Okay? Use these stones to not always determine God's will. So I want to stop there at this point. There's some, some studs I've done outside that um, help bring some clarity to the things that were being used. The breastplate of righteousness, as we call it in, in reference to Yeshua, is a breastplate that shows God's righteousness toward mankind. And the righteousness that you need to receive, that you place before mankind. I put it that way because we're in a position now that we're now learning to be more like God in a full sense. We're learning to walk according to his words, his precepts, his principles. So we're not found ourselves wanting. When we walk this way, we're walking in such a way that we're now showing forth his glory, his righteousness as we walk. Remember, ye are the temple of the Lord. So with that being said, we don't want anything to fall between the cracks. We don't want any misconception, misunderstanding about what we represent or who we represent in this body. This body is yet being transformed because of the renewing of our mind, because of the placement we have in the presence of God, the word that we have indwelling us. So as we walk, as you know, if you ever notice that when you go places sometime, 
You have put a, a strong banner before God that is trying to run away from you or go away from you because, they, oh, here comes this righteous man. Oh, here comes this righteous woman. Oh, you know, they, they, they are the godly people. And, and, and it scares them because it calls them to face what's happening in their lives. And see, it's not that they're ignorant of it. They have a misunderstanding of it. And we, that's what we have to be in a position to show ourselves humble before mankind and meek before God so we follow his directions as how to draw them unto him. Okay? We don't always do it by the precept of scaring them into heaven or scaring them out of their situation because they can be scared instantly they can be scared out of it as well. They can go to a point of being um, I, I can't do this anymore because there's no hope. We want to give them hope. Give all people hope that there is a way out of this. And the way is recognizing who God really is in you. If you are the temple of God, you have all these characteristics that fall in place. You are the priest of your temple. You do wear the breastplate of righteousness and yet judgment. Because when you are righteous, it brings forth a judgment in such a way that it causes things that are not like God to go away. That's why the scripture echo the Holy Spirit comes in like a fire, okay, burning up the shaft, okay, and the wheat. All that's in there that's not like God will be burned and consumed. But that which is like God is like that fine gold or silver that's been hewn in the fire. Though it may hurt, though it may be a little painful, but once you've gone through the process, you come out pure as gold, pure silver, pure is what God would have you to be because all that stuff that was not like God has been pushed, moved, burned away. So, like I said before, when we walk into God, it's not an easy thing to do the things that we need to do because we got to crucify our flesh. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is very true. It is so true. Because once you come to an awareness of who you are in God, who God is in you, that becomes easy because you walk in that without much pain. But to get to that point, you must crucify the flesh. There must be a dying away of the flesh. So that's what this breastplate um, of righteousness and of judgment is based upon the priest of your temple, which is you, to uphold. So to get there, much like the scripture in the New Testament says, cast down imagination and every high thing that is all itself against the knowledge of God. Bring the captivity, every thought to the beings of Christ. And once your obedience is fulfilled, be prepared to re revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I said that a little wrong, but it, 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 gets the, it gets the thought across that we need to make sure that once we have obeyed God and have gotten these vain things out of our minds and our thoughts, that we're then in a position to fulfill God's will. Now, understand this. I'm a totalist in things that I do sometimes, and I had to back up and, and repent on that because I look at the big picture and still look at the little components that add to that picture. We have to look at things little by little. As I grow from one point to another, I haven't got the full scope, but I got enough to get to that particular point. So that means that when I've learned how to stop saying certain things because it's not convenient for those that are around me to hear my words. Then I understand that the words I say have power. I'm, I'm, I'm then rationalizing how it's not good anymore to say these things because when I say things that hurt people's feelings, that cause people to feel contrary about themselves, that make them feel less of themselves, then I'm not doing them any good, nor am I doing God any good. So when I learn how to control my tongue, put it under subjection to God, then I find myself learning that thing. That's not the whole picture because then there's actions that come behind the speaking that I have to then learn how to curtail, how to put under subjection to God, rationalizing in my mind, in my spirit, based upon God's word, that things that I was saying and doing were not right. Now, as I begin to get to that point of understanding of what is right and what is wrong in my mind, 
I have to make sure that stays in control. Remember, cast down imagination. Everything that comes into your mind is not of God. Some things you stir up of, your, of yourself and some things then planted by the devil. But we have to be aware to recognize these things and know how to fight against them. Just like when Jesus was uh, baptized of John, he spent uh, 30 days fasting and went into the wilderness and was tested of the devil. And what was the fight that he had with the devil? It was a battle of the word. He tried to persuade this Jesus, not being aware that he was the son of God. He thought he was. He wasn't sure because he was disguised in flesh. Okay. That he thought that he would be able to pursue and make this man call fall because of the weakness of the flesh. But yet, even in the weakness of the flesh, God showed himself powerful in him to fight against this devil who used the word perverted, okay, to try to persuade this man to go a different way. But the God in Jesus, Yeshua, knew the balance of the word by spirit and gave him the word again in the right context. So that's the learning process too. We grow in grace and in knowledge. We learn how to discern the spirit and spirits that come our way because we recognize that every spirit that comes our way and say, holy, holy is not of God. We read it earlier in, in the book of Jeremiah about how that the people came and said, because this is a temple of God, say this temple, this temple, this is a temple that they could do what they want to do because they looked at the physical aspect and not the spiritual aspect. So as we go through talking about the temple and God spoke concerning the priest in this manner, that he was making a physical example of what should be happening spiritually. Because remember he said, I want them to build me a sanctuary so that I can dwell among them. Our body represents that sanctuary. This is where the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is. So when he indwells us, he sits upon the mercy seat that we have a, a built up inside of us to be what he would have us to be, to issue mercy, okay? Remember Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Well, we have to be that point of contact for mankind who has not seen the glory of God, for those who have not understood the glory of God. Even those in the church who've gone to church on a regular basis have not known him because they, they practice religion in our relationship. And that's what we need to be in, in particular with God, a relationship with him that is more powerful than we could ever imagine. I know I got stung a breastplate here for a minute. I do apologize. I want to talk about some of the colors, some of the um, things that were used in the temple um, and what their meanings were. Um, let me get to that now. I got quite a bit of information here. In fact, I don't want to miss nothing. Let me go back up to um, the gate, the door, and the veil. We get back to the... Um, the colors he used and why he used them, okay? The gate or the outer court, we find in Exodus 27, 16 through 19. The door to the holy place is Exodus 26, 36 through 37. Also chapter 36, 37, 38. And the veil to the holy of holies, or the most holy is Exodus 26, um, 31 through 33. So those are things there for your reading to look at those particular things, how they were made. They were made with certain garments, certain colors, certain twine to emphasize the separation, but yet a significance of the colors of the royalty of those particular colors. So let's look at that real quick. Um, let's see. Um... The colors of the fine linen curtains. Let's look at that. White linen was used for garments for royalty and purses of rank and has been found in the tombs of the pharaohs as well. The linen always speaks of purity and righteousness. Okay. 
So that's one portion of it, but it was also dyed, colored, and put in with the reds, the blues, and the purples. These colors, for example, blue was um, a, a color which meant faithfulness, is, is maintaining righteousness and purity at all costs. It's loyal and true. So blue, as you probably heard the phrase say, is true blue. It's because that's an aspect of loyalty, aspect of faithfulness and righteousness. Okay? Um, it's also a, a heavenly color, like sky blue. It's also a color of nobility. Uh, we recognize the qualities of, Lord, uh, of our Lord Jesus, he came from heaven and returned in the divine, into a divine soul, or as a divine soul, okay? And he was known, or foreknown, before the foundation of the world and was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, First Peter 1 and 20. Um, let's look at scarlet. Scarlet represents Christ's blood that was shed. So this was a preemptive view what was going to take place when Christ gave up his life on behalf of us. That blood had to be in place. Now, the, the purpose of the blood, Jesus said that the life in the blood. So since he was born of a young maiden without the aid of man, he was born with the blood of God. Okay? So the blood of God dripped from the cross into the earth. And since we're part of the earth, it dripped into us. So when he said he died for the whole world, it literally means the whole world. When he died for sinners of any capacity, whatever you want to capitalize as the biggest sin, the smallest sin, he died for them all. For in his eyes, there's no big sin, little sin. All have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. All have missed the mark. Okay, now understanding what God said because it's for you not to sin, not for God. Because if you sin, you destroy yourself and your situation. If you miss the mark, it's because you will fall and not be able to come back up to where God will have you to be. So, no matter how bad the sin is, may appear in your eyes or how bold it may appear in your eyes god sees the sin as the same that you have missed the mark of what i'm trying to make you you have missed the mark of understanding of who you really are in me and because you have missed the mark i can wipe that away from you if you just accept the sacrifice of Jesus the Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. And if you accept the sacrifice that he's made for you, because no blood of any goat or ram is equivalent to the blood of man. Okay? So it had to take a man who had no sin. A man who did not fail God in things that he was to do. Because if you notice, many times when Jesus walked as a man, and he did certain things, when he baptized John, what happened? A voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. He echoed the voice again in other places about, This is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. So what does that really mean to us? That means that if we grab hold to the beloved son and allow him to be part of us and we be part of him we are now in the beloved we are now joint heirs with Christ we are now the believers that need to walk the earth as he said we should there's a there's a, a parable aka new testament story where Jesus said if I be planted, there will be many that will come up like me. So what is like him? He was humble. He was meek. But at the same time, all powerful, able to forgive sins, able to heal. 
There are many things more on top of that he was able to do, but he wanted to let you know that you are now that person. If you accept the fullness of what God has for you now, and you walk according to his principles, you are the temple of God. There's more I'm going to share with you too. Um, I'm going to stop at purple because purple is uh, another color of royalty. It's the combination of red and blue coming together. So we got the loyalty of the, of the blue, the sacrifice of the blood of the, of, of the red, bringing forth the purple of true royalty. So, you know, if you ever deal with colors, that does make purple, okay? Red and blue make purple. So that coming together shows a combination of loyalty, purity before God, the sacrifice, accepting the fullness of that, becomes purple. Once that's represented, it's represented the fullness of what God wants us to be in him. I'm going to stop there today, my friends. Hopefully, we'll pick up some more on the temple, more on the temple that you are. So it'll be more of what he will have us to be. There's a lot more to go in this study. And I want you to hold on with me, go with me, and understand the basic premise is, do you know who you are in God? If you do, hallelujah. If you don't, grab hold. Let's get some more of this. God bless you. And again, I also throw it out there. If you know something more than me in some areas, or you got a better idea or thought, don't hesitate to contact me, either through YouTube or through my email, which is uh, worldviewingyou at, uh, at outlook.com. It's worldviewingyou at outlook.com. God bless you. Till next time, peace.